Our next presentation is uh, entitled Maintenance uh, Maladies, uh, Who is Minding the Fountain? And the presenter is Exusia Flandro. Exusia is currently working as a senior architectural conservator at Jablonski uh, Building Conservation in New York City. Uh, she has a master's degree in historic preservation for com from Columbia University. Columbia is obviously well represented today. <laughs> um, she graduated from Columbia University with a master's of science in historic preservation in 2009 and received her bachelor's of fine arts in sculpture and ceramics from the University of Utah in 2007. While at JBC, uh, Exusia has conducted large-scale uh, uh, conditions assessments, sampling, testing, and analysis, as well as the development and implementation of conservation treatments for the exterior and interior of architectural materials. Special interests include uh, architectural metals, early aluminum uh, architecture, glazed polychrome terracotta, and early uses of building material testing procedures. Exusia is a professional associate with the American Institute for Conservation. Thank you. Um, today I'd like to present to you all the story of the Library of Congress, Whittall Courtyard, Fountain, and Pool. The masonry pool and bronze statue have been the victims of numerous well-intentioned but ill-informed maintenance procedures. Just as a visual introduction here, there, here are a few images of the pool and the fountain. The fountain sits in an inner courtyard of the Library of Congress Thomas Jefferson Building and is roughly oriented east to west. Located directly across from the U.S. Capitol Building, the Library of Congress opened its doors in 1897. Designed in the Italian Renaissance style by architects Smith, Meyer, and Peltz, the structure housed the books and references formerly housed inside the Capitol building. When it opened, it was described as being the largest, costliest, and safest building in the world. As part of its design, it included four interior courtyards to help gain light into the interior portions of the building. The plan of the building is rectangular in nature, um, and by 1930, three of the four cart courtyards had been filled. Uh, the fountain and pool in question today are located in the northwest courtyard, highlighted here in red. In 1925, a donation by Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge was resulted in the construction of the Coolidge Auditorium. As part of this alteration, a fountain and pool were installed in the courtyard. Only a small two-sentence reference was found indicating its construction. A concrete pool, approximately 12 feet wide by 36 feet long, with a sloping depth from 2 to 2 and a half feet, and lined with frost-proof tile, and having a coping, limestone, a coping of limestone, was built in the northwest courtyard. This pool, 18 evergreens, and 8 cement benches were purchased from a from a special fund for the purpose given by Miss Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge. And that statement was published in 1928 and that's the only record of its construction. Um, there are some early drawings, however. This early plan here indicates this, or, sorry. This early drawing indicates the slope of the pool, placement of brass pipes and drains, as well as frost-proof tile, limestone, and concrete. This is an image of the completed pool looking northeast. At some point, um, this picture was taken, we believe, in 1927, but it could have been anywhere from 1925 to 1938. And again, another image of the pool in the courtyard. Um, in 1939, another addition, the Whittall Pavilion, was constructed in the courtyard. Funded by Gertrude, Gertrude Clark Whittall, the new building was designed to house Stradivari instruments and to hold concerts where the instruments would be played. When the Whittall Pavilion was added, the original footprint of the pool was cut in half, and a limestone niche was added at one end. 
A stair was placed on the west end of the courtyard to provide access to the fountain and courtyard. An addition, additional feature was added, which was a sculpture designed by Frederick McMoney's entitled Pan of Rohalian, which was also donated by Mrs. Whittall to the Library of Congress from her private collection. The bronze sculpture with water features was placed in the limestone niche. Here are two images of the pool and fountain as it appears today. Um, before going too much further, I thought that it would be important to briefly touch on the history of some of the materials that were utilized in this fountain. The tiles in the fountain are frost-proof faience tile, believed to be manufactured by the Groovy Faience Company. Um, handmade faience tiles were advertised as being frost-proof and therefore ideal for exterior work, um, as well as in areas where they were exposed to continual dampness, such as swimming pools and public shower rooms. The, um, in this slide here, the image on your left, we see the fans tiles utilized in the shower room for the pool at Dartmouth College. And that's from 1921. Um, in, in a 1922 article on installing groovy fans tiles in a pool suggests that the concrete backing kept keys created for the tiles by embedding galvanized or copper nails in the concrete pour and then the concrete be allowed to cure for 28 days, after which the nails would be bent and the adjacent concrete surfaces scored in preparation for the parge coat. The wall would then be parged level using a mortar mix consisting of one part cement to pour four parts sand. After cure, the tiles were recommended to be set in a bed of mortar consisting of one part cement to two parts sand, modified with a waterproofing additive at the rate of two quarts waterproofing to one cubic foot of mortar. Um, the tiles were also recommended to be soaked in water and just prior to setting in the bedding material, um, the bedding material would be actually float, placed on the float itself and then put directly on the parch coat before the tiles were installed. Here's a photograph of these frostproof tiles in the Library of Congress fountain. And what's really curious about this is that the color, the reflected color of the tiles changes significantly when it has water in it. Um, they kind of go from a blue-green color to a very kind of fluorescent green, which is quite shocking in this little courtyard. Um, here's a photograph of the pool taken in the winter after it was drained and then allowed to dry a little bit. Um, next, where did the sculpture come from? Well, in 1889, Mac Moniz was con commissioned by Stanford White to design the Pan of Rohalian for an estate in Rumson, New Jersey. And here's an image of the family sitting around uh, the fountain, leisurely eating their lunch, I guess. <laughs> an excellent description of the fountain. I would like to read partly because I think it's funny. But <laughs> and this was published in 1913. In the pan of Rohalian, the boy stands upon a ball supported by miniature dolphins, which spout their streams of water and looked up as if listening. While he blows two reeds that issue at a broad angle from his impish mouth, leaning back to inflate his chest until his body describes an arc. It is the attitude of a saucy child that has taken the measure of its little self from the affectionate indulgence that surrounds it. Again, not an antique type, nor a rustically impish like a puck, but with the engaging elegance and self-consciousness roguery of a certain kind of modern urchin." End quote. Um, Macmonies went on to make numerous copies of the sculpture in various different sizes, and so there are a whole lot of these. <laughs> The Panna of Rahalian in the Courtyard is one of these later reproductions, and it's stamped and signed by the artist, 1894. The image on your right is one of the same sculptures located at the Palm Beach Garden um, Reserve in Florida. And what we were looking for in particular were, was this same sculpture that was still being used as a fountain. Several of these are now in museums where they no longer have plumbing actually working in them. Um, here are two more of the same, one formerly located in the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and the other in the Atlantic Botanical Garden. And then here's the one that we're speaking about today. Um, so 
The first thing we did was a conditions assessment of all the materials starting with the tile. The tile was actually generally in fair condition with only isolated areas of incompatible repairs, glaze falls, and replacement tiles. Um, much of this replacement tiles assumed to come from when the fountain's footprint was cut in half. Um, there's also just isolated areas of hairline cracking below the limestone coping stones where the joints were open in the limestone. The, um, the limestone was in a little bit worse condition than the tile. The two, there were two blocks highlighted here in red that actually had been previously repa replaced, which there isn't really a record of when they were replaced, but it, they believe it was in the late 1980s. And the, all of the skyward facing joints and caulk joints had failed. All the mortar joints, however, were in good condition. Um, there was also large blooms of biological growth as well as heavy metallic staining in and around the niche. The granite pedestal on which the statue stands is, was in poor condition with numerous previous cementitious repairs. Some of these had failed, some had caused other damage. Uh, major cracks were found in the plate portion of the pedestal on which the bronze sits, and the pedestal also had surface falls as well as uh, hard water deposits. We were not asked to survey the brick wall of the limestone niche, however, it could easily be seen that heavy biological growth was present and in some areas, or in some areas as well as prevalent efflorescent blooms. The bronze was actually surveyed twice, once in the winter and again in the following spring so we could assess how the water was flowing through the fountain. We found that the sculpture actually had quite a bit of mechanical damage in the form of cracking of the dolphin tails, one of the reeds was loose, and best of all, the statue had had a hole drilled through the back of the garland, and a ferrous bolt attached to a bronze wire was then attached to the limestone niche. The sculpture also had numerous previous brazing repairs, and the ball on which Pan stands was deformed on one side. Some of the dolphin mouths had been altered at some point to accommodate new plumbing fixtures. The surface patina was in poor condition with copper chlorides forming at the bottom of the sculpture around the dolphins. Uneven patina formation on much of the front of the sculpture was causing a visual disfigurement and only small remnants of a protective coating were left. And we did find Sorry. We did find, if you look on the lower left-hand photograph, what we believe was the earliest, not the, early, the earliest remaining patina, because there, there are protected areas because of the way this is positioned in the niche. So as part of our recommendation, we recommended that that patina try to be restored by a bronze conservator, if possible, and if not matched. Um, so we also surveyed the fountain while it was on. And the first thing we noticed that was there was absolutely no control on how high the streams of water were coming out of the sculpture. Um, the fountain was being fed just by the building supply of water, which had uneven pressures at the garden level. So who knows, maybe someone inside was flushing a toilet and then suddenly the streams were like shooting 15 feet. And consequently, no one sits in this courtyard because you never know when you're going to get wet. <laughs> so, <laughs> or if they did, they would stand up on the staircase away from Pam. <laughs> so, um, in addition, the pool didn't drain correctly, so it frequently overflowed, causing the death of all border landscaping. And we're assuming that the overflow also accelerated the deterioration of the caulk. The plumbing was in poor condition and it was difficult to determine, to determine where the problems even started. <laughs> um, here's one of the drains which had been filled with concrete and because the other two drains were located on the same side of the pool, they easily clogged with uh, biological debris causing again the pool to overflow. Now, speaking with the maintenance personnel about the fountain, we found out that the granite pedestal had some point broken half, likely in the 18 or in the 1980s or 90s, <laughs> and this had sent Pan flying into the pool. 
Luckily, the pool was, at the, was full at the time, and this kind of cushioned his fall, because they came in the next morning and he was laying in the pool. So. They repaired the pedestal in-house with a concrete mix, and Pan was sent off-site to be repaired, which we assume was where all the breeze repairs came from. And then it was repositioned on the repaired pedestal. Um, more recently, when new cracks started to form in the granite pedestal again, they drilled. that's when they drilled the hole into the garland on the back of Pan and attached them to the limestone. They used bronze wire because they knew some a little bit about corrosion and knew if they used the same material, but they made the mistake of using a ferrous bolt to attach their bronze wire. <laughs> so, and the idea was that the wire wouldn't keep him from falling if the pedestal broke, but it would keep him from tilting forward as the pedestal broke. So there's also some records that at some point the water had been heavily chlorinated, similar to just um, residential pool maintenance, which would explain some of the efflorescent blooms and copper chlorides which are formed at the base of the sculpture. Um, the water we found had been chlorinated to prevent biological growth on the limestone, um, which apparently was why the two limestone units were replaced in the niche, because they couldn't remove the biological staining that had occurred. So kind of, this is an escalating <laughs> problem. <laughs> so what we learned from all this was the extreme importance of maintenance monitoring and how periodic monitoring could have prevented the majority of the problems now occurring at this fountain. So as part of the preservation plan for the site, we recommended that a maintenance program be implemented and that it include a concise maintenance manual. Um, I like to think of it in terms as a car maintenance manual, which has all the crucial, crucial information, but also tells you when to take the car to a mechanic. And if needed, the mechanic can contact the specialist. The, mechanic, or the manual should include an educational portion where general information is given about each material and what to look for in terms of basic deterioration. An example would be granite and cracking. The manual would also include how to monitor each material, measurements, photographs, checklists, as well as how frequently this monitoring is to be completed. An updated contact sheet is to be included in the manual, so if at some point of concern is observed, the correct party can be contacted. Um, one project that we had good results with this sort of program on a smaller scale was, is at the Tenement Museum in New York City, where the cleaning personnel are just directed to tell the manager of the museum when they clean up plaster dust. And in turn, the manager of the museum takes a look at where the plaster dust came from and then decides whether or not to call the plaster conservator for further inspection. Um, for this purpose, also general treatment reports issued by a conservator or a specialist should be easily accessible in case they are needed for future reference. For all maintenance procedures to be completed in-house, a step-by-step procedure with product data information and any tools required is to be in the manual. Uh, for this fountain, that would be something like treating the limestone for biological growth perhaps twice a year. At minimum, the person in charge of monitoring the fountain should be capable of understanding when a change has occurred, which could lead to more catastrophic damage. The plan should easily allow for changes in personnel, and while it should be thorough, it needs to be concise so that it is actually used and implemented. For the individual materials, a hierarchy of materials has to be established by the owner and con conservator and specialist involved. So if necessary, the condition of one could be sacrificed to save another. For example, in this fountain, we would say that the bronze ranks slightly higher than the granite pedestal because the bronze has more value and meaning to the Library of Congress than the pedestal. So it may be necessary to replace the pedestal. Um, creating this hierarchy may not be as simple as it is in the case of this fountain, but is essential to the preservation of fountains um, as they are meant to be active sculptures. In addition, if, uh, if at all possible, there should be one person who is in charge of monitoring the fountain on a regular basis. Um, what had occurred at the Library of Congress was that no one really had the job of monitoring the fountain, and so it was passively taken care of 
in terms of interventions only after something had failed. And in the interventions, while very well intentioned in this case, were not always appropriate and in some cases caused further deterioration of the historic fabric. It is our hope with, that with a strong implementation of a monitoring program and a maintenance manual in the historic preservation plan, plan that the preservation of Fountain and Pool will be ensured over time. I thank you for giving me the time to speak about this fountain and hopefully provided some guidance and maintenance man for on maintenance manuals and also the consequences of what not having one are um, so that we can keep Pan and other flying sculptures grounded for the time being. Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, uh, Carol. Well, I'm just curious. I, I've spent a fair amount of time at the Library of Congress. Congress. I've never seen the sculpture. Is it accessible to the public? It is no Archer longer Rangers? accessible. It's no longer? No longer accessible. It's now only accessible to employees because this area can only be reached by a private elevator and you have to have a special clearance to get into this. So how you can see it, however, is go to the stacks. Also facing... You're not allowed in the stacks <laughs> at the library. Look for a mysterious bathroom. Go down the wrong <laughs> hallway. Um, <laughs> but you can see it through some of the windows of the neighboring building. John? Uh, so I was interested a couple of times, at least. I think you said that you have, um, that you observed copper chloride or chlorides. How do you know what they were? Um, we don't exactly know that that's exactly what they were, but... <laughs> We're believing that's what they are, mainly because after doing a little bit of research on bronze disease, we believe that this sort of powdering that we were seeing was caused by contact with chlorides. And did you see the kind of massive erosion of the bronze under that that we kind of expect if it was after the uh, We did on some of the dolphin tells. And also on the lettering, there it says pan of Rohalian around the bottom, and some of that um, when you kind of pick at it with like a like a plastic dental tool, like it basically falls off. And did you see the progressive and progression and color of the corrosion from white when it first developed to a, a greener color as it becomes a slightly different compound? Um, I don't remember seeing that. I do remember seeing some of the white powdering, but I'm not so sure about a progression of color within one area of deterioration. Raise that because it's so common for us to mention bronze disease. It's actually an alarm factor that helps us get attention of our clients and so forth. But the actual uh, observation of fluoride uh, on the surface of uh, bronze is, um, uh, is interesting. It does not, it's not always there, but I think it is. Uh, but it should be a major alarm factor. I, I mean, I can say that one thing is this kind of reminded me like when you see marble deteriorating outside when it looks okay and then you touch it and you know you have marble in your hand and, um, and that's kind of what this appeared to be where it looked okay until you kind of dug into it a little bit and then it, there's it just powdering underneath the surface layer Other questions? Thank you.